Um, the first speaker is Neve Nirayan uh, from the National uh, Library of Ireland. And she's going to speak to Trent Outreach, what's it all about. So my name is Eve, as Stephanie said, and I work in the learning or the uh, education uh, department in the National Library of Ireland in uh, Dublin. Um, can I just check when you all hear me okay? Yeah? Um, so today I'm going to speak very briefly to you about some things uh, outreach. I'm going to discuss some of the more challenging aspects of outreach, uh, give you an example of how um, my colleague used some really beautiful digitised watercolours from our print and drawings collection to draw a new younger uh, audience into the National Library. And I'll share some uh, tips and advice um, that myself and my colleagues have learned from uh, experience, shall we say. So, what is outreach? Um, the term outreach can mean all sorts of things to all sorts of people, and there are many definitions of outreach available as well. So just for clarity's sake, um, I'm going to go very briefly through what it is we do in the outreach department in the NLI or the National Library of Ireland. So our exhibitions section of outreach, um, they cover the long-term planning of the NLI's exhibitions and select, and select uh, the material and the subject matter for those exhibitions. And it can be determined by a number of various different factors, including but in no way limited to uh, upcoming <coughs> historical anniversaries and, and centenaries, of which there are a number of them at the moment, uh, external influences, so for example, if we're approached by um, a third party to create or collaborate on an exhibition, the NLI's collection, of course, and also the NLI's overriding strategy as well. Um, interpretation or curating material is also be an important aspect of the exhibition team's uh, work, and as my colleague before I came here, um, she pointed out to me, she said they could use the same material for different uh, exhibitions, but could create for very, very different uh, exhibitions depending on how they interpreted that material. So the section that I work in, the learning or education section, we're responsible for researching, developing and delivering tours of our exhibitions and of the building, uh, researching, developing and delivering various types of workshops based on our collections. We schedule and organise a programme of events including public tours, talks, lectures, workshops, seminars and various other events as well and we conduct research of our own as well. So for example, for a talk or tour that we're delivering ourselves, or uh, if we're working with an external organization. And we also cover uh, social media as well. So these are just some, I suppose, of the challenges that you might face as an outreach practitioner. Um, and the first, of course, is the visitor. So while, of course, we want every, um, uh, sorry, all members of, of the public that you interact with in your organization their visit sometimes and it is extremely rare in fairness and um, you will find a screaming child or a grumpy parent or maybe just a general visitor who for whatever reason may be unhappy and um, they may make it known to you either by crying or making a complaint although generally it is the children who do the, the crying um, but my advice really is to actively listen so don't just stand there and pretend you're listening and start thinking about how you're going to respond but actually listen to what the person is saying and um, acknowledge their complaints I'll apologize obviously if necessary and of course follow any policies or procedures that you may have um, within your organization and um, if you yourself are upset afterwards because let's face it it's not a pleasant experience um, remember that all you can do really is your best and while we certainly aim to, it is difficult to, um, to please everyone. We are all very different in our nature and we're in our personalities and therefore sometimes it's just not possible. Uh, and of course we also all have our very bad days as well so it may not necessarily be you or the activity that the person is upset by. In regards to the next point, don't be afraid to say no. Um, this relates I suppose really to certain situations. Um, just as an example, literally last week I was giving a public tour of the National Library building um, and a young man approached me and asked if he could bring his um, group of 28 Italian visitors on the tour. While we obviously all want to increase footfall and visitor numbers etc, we do have to ensure that that is not uh, done to the detriment of our visitors experience and as it turned out, the young man actually had a tour group um, of 28 Italian English language students between the ages of 10 and 14. Um, as their learning needs, of course, would be very different to a general public tour, I told them that unfortunately it wasn't possible today and gave him our contact details for future use. So obviously if I said yes, 
neither the 28 Italian students or the members of the public who've come for the tour would have actually enjoyed their experience. And actually, it turns out he had actually called my colleague the day before to ask if he could bring them, and she'd also said no. So he was really just passing his arm. Resource constraints. So unfortunately, many of us here, I'm sure, are aware and have felt the effects of uh, staffing restraints over the past few years. Um, so there's just three of us in the learning kind of section in outreach and last summer myself and my two colleagues in the learning section decided to put a number of children's workshops or and drop-in sessions on for the month of July. So we researched, developed and delivered uh, one child's workshop per week and one drop-in session per week as well. So it did go incredibly well and more importantly our younger visitors really did enjoy it as well. Um, it was a lot of work and we really did underestimate actually just how tired we would be. So I suppose the point really here is just to be aware of the resources you have. Uh, don't overextend yourself um, as you will eventually just burn out, burn out. And again the phrase actually don't be afraid to say no can, can be applied here as well. Um, reusing materials for workshops and adapting them and changing them to various groups to suit their requirements can help to reduce the workload on staff. Uh, particularly, obviously, if they are under time constraints or pressure as well. The final point there is perceptions of outreach. So, as I said earlier, the term outreach can mean so many different things to so many different people. So, the first thing people say to me normally when I say I work in outreach is, oh, like tours and stuff. And of course, tours are a very big part of what we do. It is often the unstuck part that they don't really know about, or they underestimate, or they, maybe they just don't really think too much about it either. So when speaking to people, don't assume that they know exactly what outreach involves, and remember that outreach as a term, at least, um, is a relatively new one as well. Um, another tip I suppose I would have would be that all staff meetings, so where departments uh, take it in turns to give a presentation on what they're currently working on, uh, are really useful, particularly in an organisation that has different departments. Um, and as an outreach staff member who generally tends to be dealing with the public more often, they're invaluable because they keep you up to date with all of the outgoings on in the library, which means you can answer questions or disseminate the information when dealing with the public. And these all staff meetings can also be converted into talks, maybe or lectures for the public then as well, obviously depending on their content. So we're going to get to the really good stuff now. Okay. Um, so these are just some examples of um, a workshop that my colleague did. She basically took some prints and drawings, that, uh, material that we had, by images you can see an example here, um, by a woman called Miss Battlesby. They dated from about 1801 to 1840 maybe, we're not really sure, we didn't have a huge amount of information. But she basically took the images, showed them to the children, I'll show you some more examples here. And after she'd showed the images to the kids, she took the children on a walk through the building. We have a number of different architectural features highlighting birds. So we used what we had and she went off uh, on her little trail and they then came back then and did their own kind of birds as well. So you can see them there as well. So some helpful hints then. Um, I suppose engaging audiences, it is or can be uh, very challenging um, and really I suppose in a technology heavy world especially it really really is um, and I guess really the thing I would say would be that you need to try and break down the barriers of people's perceived notions so for us in the National Library our building, building is Victorian it's um, incredibly daunting and intimidating so really it's trying to break down that barrier of people feeling they're not welcome there um, local and community initiatives as well, have a look in your local area and um, see what people are doing around you. If there aren't any initiatives or any kind of uh, cultural activities for the local community, why not set one up and get in touch with people who um, might be actually able to help you or benefit from it as well. Um, reuse what you already have, so from the four workshops that we did and the drop-in sessions we did last year, we can now reuse those if need be. Um, obviously that doesn't mean don't go off and create new workshops. Um, but um, it means that you, obviously, you have a bank basically of what you can use if you need to. Children obviously can be our harshest critics as well, um, so I suppose really if you just embrace that and accept it as well, um, they can be some of the most fun workshops you'll ever do in your life. Um, I got asked at one of the workshops if I was a grandmother. <laughs> I'm not a <laughs> um, and expect the unexpected. So, like I say, 
expect, you don't expect it. It just happens when you're dealing with children in particular. Um, might mostly though really just enjoy it because I think when you yourself are enjoying what you do, it's evident to the people who are visiting um, and as a result they'll take the cue from you really as well. So I've kind of covered a few things there but really to me I suppose for outreach what it is is to, as I said, kind of break down the frequency of notions um, and I suppose as well Really, it's to show that for us, the National Library of Ireland, uh, it's more than just a library as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, the next speaker um, is Sarah Shenton from Manchester Metropolitan University. We'll be talking about Inspired by a conference, batch making at Manchester Metropolitan University. Yeah, it's not as exciting as what you've just seen. <laughs> <laughs> I can't follow that part. It's just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to fall over a while before I've even started. Sorry. Can I ask you to hear me at yes. I can get a lot louder, which the front row will not appreciate. <laughs> Uh, so as, as you said, my name is Sarah Shenton so I'm, uh, and I work at Manchester Metropolitan University Library and so I want to talk about a particular project. Um, I don't know how many people were in Dublin last year? A few yeses, a few noes. Um, the person who inspired this is actually in the audience which is similarly intimidating as well. Um, but anyway, last year I, attended, I, got, uh, I got the chance to go to Dublin and I attended a very exciting talk by Megan. <laughs> And she was talking about maker spaces, uh, DIY craft, different activities and projects she tried. So I picked up my copy of the library colouring book that you, were, you gave out and things. I took it back to the library. I, and I started getting very excited about all the things I'd seen, telling my colleagues about these things. And unfortunately, at that point, my manager, who runs our welcome and induction campaign, got a particular glint in her eye. <laughs> and hence the title of being inspired. So to give you some context, if I can find the next button. It's always nice when you have a look. There we go. When you're a laptop, you don't know. Um, the university itself has a large welcome festival. So every September we have a new intake of undergraduate students. So uh, many of you from university libraries, you're all familiar with the madness that descends in once September hits. Yeah, we don't see it until Christmas. Um, but basically, students move into their accommodation a weekend before the welcome week starts. That's how we branded it. the university branded our induction week. Um, and basically, they put on a big event on the Sunday to welcome the students, and so there's lots of events. Uh, basically, they have a big fair in the business school, uh, they have cooking demonstrations, they have sports societies, and we get a very nice sign in the park, just to make sure they know they're welcome. And in previous years, we've had a very exciting stall um, in the business school, we've had quizzes and various activities, and that's one of my colleagues, and a couple of our, we employ some student champions as well, who help with the programme. However, this year, they wanted us to do something different. Um, so the university basically said to our welcome team that basically we'd like you to do something uh, a little bit quieter, a little bit more reflective, something away from business in case students get a bit overwhelmed with how much stuff is actually going on in the business school. Um, so basically we thought we'd run something in our very exciting name, Chat Zone. We spent a lot of time on that name, <laughs> which is on the ground floor of the library. And so my, basically my colleagues in the welcome team were looking for different, uh, different kinds of activities that we could use. So we'd already come up, uh, we've got some very creative people, we've created a bookmark, people could colour in. Uh, one of our library assistants happens to be able to give origami demonstrations, um, which is a, a really good skill to have. Um, however, a third option was needed. So of course I came along after conference talking about all these exciting things, and I started talking about badge making. <coughs> Which point my, my manager went, yes, that is what we need to do. <laughs> now, the only downside of that is you have, you have a very good idea. It seems to generate an awful lot of work for the person who had the idea. <laughs> my manager's not in the room, so I can say that. <laughs> so basically, before long, um, I was costing out badge making machines. Uh, because we wanted, we had to put a bid in for the university's welcome campaign funding so that they would allow us to buy the machine. Uh, we were having exciting discussion about badge sizes using rulers. We knew that you could have, that you can buy badges in so many multiple forms. Um, we made the bid, we were successful, they gave us the money, a machine was duly bought. Um, didn't tell you that you actually have to put it together, so I, I, <laughs> I had a very exciting watch the manufacturer's video about how to secure it properly down. There was then very nice, if you work in a university you'll understand this, but we had to do a health and safety risk assessment to complete the form, <laughs> if anyone's gone through that process. Um, yeah, my manager and I in, in a meeting room trying out the badge maker to write the health of yeah. <laughs> and then somebody needed to write instructions, since so I've watched the videos, I could write the instructions, and then somebody needed to train the library champions, so I knew what I was doing, so I trained the library champions, <laughs> and this is our very exciting badge maker. We did actually pick one that makes badges and key rings. It was a late decision. 
Um, so clearly the event came, but we thought what would be nice is we actually wanted to provide some images. Um, students uh, either could design their own image, or they could actually have something that if they didn't want to stay for too long, could take something away. Now, working in libraries, images and copyright is a very, very big minefield. So we're very lucky that we actually have some very talented artists. These are all images from MMU that were created from our marketing team within the library. Um, the Manchester Bee, we bought, it's our version of the Manchester Bee. Uh, this is a little face, a character called Bookface who we use in our branding. And just generally, you've got to like a library. <laughs> Um, what we thought might also be nice to do is also promote our special collections. So I don't know if you know, but Manchester Metropolitan University Library has actually its own museum and gallery within the actual building of the library. Upon the third floor we actually have an accredited museum. Um, and one of the things they actually have is a collection of decorated papers, which we own quite a lot of, um, called the Schmoller Collection. Um, so they very nicely let me choose images. And then um, I got very exciting, so I got a very exciting afternoon and they got one of their oldest books out so I could take and make this book, book, books and flowers. Again, just something different so we can promote special collections at the same time. So, we duly ran the event. This is my colleague. Thankfully I was not there when we were doing the social media video, hence why I'm not in the video. It should play, but I'm, I have no idea where the mouse is on this machine, but you can imagine she's pulling down the badge. That's, that's, I'm afraid I'm not quite as excited as I go to that. Um, but, so what did we learn from the event? Actually, it was a fantastic event. Um, admittedly, we have to wear the more black and pink t-shirts, which are really attractive. Um, but it was a really interesting way to interact with students, really informal way. It was really lovely, actually, because you got students, students sitting down interacting with each other that wouldn't necessarily talk to each other. We had some international students who came and tried out their English on us. Uh, we actually had a couple of mature students who'd actually brought the children along to the event, so we were able to actually make up some badges for their kids and also talk to the mature student about being back at university, what kind of support we could offer them in the library, quite informally as well. Um, also, uh, and things, uh, I made up a ba member of um, badges and key rings for members of staff, um, one of which I didn't know, but turned out to be a pro vice chancellor, which is very good PR for the library. <laughs> and my colleague was like, do you know who that is? I'm like, no. Uh, anyway, it was one of our pro vice chances, I now know. Um, so that was very, went down very well. And again, it was actually a fantastic way for us to promote special collections in a kind of indirect way as well, and to encourage people to go and actually view the exhibition and, uh, and view the collections up there as part of their course. Um, as I say, it did work fantastically well. There are a few things that didn't work quite so well. Um, I did learn every way about how to jam a badge maker as well, how to unjam a badge maker as well. We hadn't used it, used it for that period, so I'm now an expert on how to unjam it if you jam it. If you had a student sit there for half an hour designing something, to put it in the machine is quite terrifying. Um, but thankfully we got much better as the day went on. Um, one of the small problems was, uh, I don't know if you can see in the sign here, we, we had signs and we also had uh, library champions outside the library attracting people in, but we were actually down from the main event, it was in the building next door, and, that, and the accommodation was the other side. So it did mean we'd actually got less traffic than we'd actually hoped. So it was a bit of a shame, because uh, we had lots of great things. Uh, you can see some of the fantastic origami that's also produced at the same event, and then this is a sample of some of the badges and key rooms that we made up. Uh, one of the tips, actually, that I did pay attention to as much as I should from Megan's talk was about recording information as you go along. You get so swept up in making things, you do need to actually remember to record stuff about the event as you go along rather than just statistics. So that is an excellent tip to remember because at the end of the day, I was like, what have I done? <laughs> um, we did also we run the event. Uh, we had a Meet Me at the Museum event uh, for our talk postgraduates in January, but unfortunately, our take up was incredibly low. Um, and then we're now looking at different ways that we can explore it and reuse badge making in different events with staff and again with students. So basically that is badge making that's directly inspired from last year's conference. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the next speaker is Megan Lutz from Rutgers State University of New Jersey, um, who's been referenced already. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, she's speaking at the, the Art Library Inside and Outside outreach and engagement in academic art libraries. And we have up to 10 minutes, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm only planning seven, but you never know. There'll be loads of time for questions. Absolutely. So, first of all, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I know that this is not the coolest room <laughs> in the establishment, but I really appreciate everyone's attention. I certainly want to give a shout out and thanks to the conference organizers. Let's face it, there's a lot of time and effort that goes into all this, and it's really an honor to be chosen and, spoke, and, and to speak here to you all today. Um, as noted, I'm Megan Lotz. I'm the art librarian at Rutgers. Everybody here okay? 
I usually have a pretty big vessel and I'm known to be told I'm a little loud, so if it gets out of control in front, let me know. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about outreach and engagement in academic art libraries. And as a librarians and educators, I think one of the things, we all wear a lot of hats. As a library liaison to the arts, my role and my workload, responsibilities, and expectations of my departments are changing regularly. I'm now responsible for outreach, engagement, digital humanities, what does that mean? <laughs> Fair use, copyright, open access, again, huh? Uh, visual literacy skills, which are crucial for us in the arts. Data lit literacies, which I don't work with so much, but it is really important to think about. And lastly, we have to develop students that have a versatile, versatile set of lifelong learning skills. And I always say it's crucial. Tissues and candy in your office, a must. <laughs> In my case, I'm a library liaison who works with the departments of art, his art history, digital filmmaking, landscape architecture, and the visual arts at a large-scale public research institution. On my campus, where I'm at, we have five campuses split by a river and about 32,000 students. There's 69,000 students all of, all of Rutgers throughout our state. After about a year at Rutgers, one of the things that I have learned the lay of the land, but I really wanted to get to know the people in my departments, who they are, what do they do, What's happening? Because certainly they're all art and design students, and one thing you can know about that is they don't find time to come to the library. And my library is about a 25 minute walk, which might as well be 25 miles. Um, so one of the things that I talked about with the chairs was, hey, how about if I show up in your departments, in your lobby? I come once a week now to all the departments that I work with. Sometimes I have show and tell library materials. I always have my laptop. I have to have a sign of indicating who I am because for the longest time they were like, who is that creepy creeperton <laughs> sitting in our lobby talking about library stuff? And then you always have library brochures and again, candy is crucial. The one day you forget candy, you're dead to them. <laughs> but basically by providing these regular hours, I've seen an increase in my reference statistics and the number of workshops that I teach every semester. I've been asked to serve on department searches. If you really want to learn about a department, sit with the faculty who are discussing who their new colleague is going to be. You will learn way more than you probably need to. I've been asked to be guest reviewers regularly for course projects, created solid connections for the art libraries, both in and out of the library, and also with a lot of folks that I don't generally work with, and I think that that's really, really popular. And we've also created solid connections for the art library exhi exhibition spaces, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about next. In our exhibition spaces, we have cases, we have walls with a track system that's very easy to hang. For the first two or three years, so I always like to give myself a little bit of shout out. We did not have this track system, so we hung about 48 shows with fishing line. Brutal. But it worked, and we did it for almost nothing. We also have, will entertain anything in the library that does not present a fire code violation to the walls or any part of the library. We do digital exhibits in the actual monitor within the library, and we also do digital exhibits on our social media pages. These exhibit spaces have formed deeper connections to the departments with whom I liaise. They formed new connections, again, with departments and campus folks that don't normally visit the art library. They've elevated the importance of scholarly research being created in the arts on the Rutgers campuses, as well as our local community. Because the art library exhibition spaces have been so successful, we've had about 52 shows now over, I want to say, four years, and I've spent about $100 total. That's $100 for about 52 shows we've exhibited in the art libraries because we reuse our materials. <laughs> but one of the things that it's done is it's created two new exhi exhibition spaces in the undergraduate library and also in our library of science and medicine. If you'd like to learn more, at the end of this presentation, I have some um, citations. I've written a paper about this, and it's a nice short one from College and Research Library News, so it's only about three pages of hopefully awesome. <laughs> One of the things that we also regularly do is we host events in the library. And these basically are, I'll host any event that has anything that we can talk about the library, or some have some reason of why we might want them. We've hosted murder mystery nights, symposiums and panel presentations, the book sale, ugh, most annoying thing I do, but it gets the most people and they love it. Maker days, contests, and so much more. In March of 2018, we hosted the Art Library Art and Feminism Wikipedia Edit-a-thon. Someone mentioned that this morning in one of the talks. And this was a really fabulous event for us because Special Collections and, and the Institute of Women for the Arts, the Visual Arts Department and the Art Library all worked together. And we were able to pull out, I mean, we have a huge collection of feminist art within Rutgers Special Collections. So we were actually transported a lot of those very interesting rare materials over. And students actually did the editing using our very fancy rare materials from our collection. So that was one way to really get them engaged. Of course, there's snacks. And for our first event, 
I would have liked to have said we had 50, but we had about 14, and that was okay for us. It was a start. In the fall of 2018, the Art Library hosted a series for Banned Books Week, which was generously sponsored by the Freedom to Read Foundation, which is managed by the American Library Associations. This was also in response to, we had a horrendous censorship issue in the Art Library um, about two years ago. So we really needed to continue this discussion of why on earth did someone censor something in a massive public research institution that upholds most of the amendments that we have. We didn't that particular day. So I got this grant to continue this conversation. At the time, um, if anyone follows the Whitney Biennial in the United States, this particular year we had an artist, Hannah Black, demand that a work be censored, and not only censored, but destroyed. So this was a very, very important conversation that we got to talk about. We invited the students then with a lot of the money to create images about censorship and intellectual freedom. And then we got out the button maker. <laughs> so we made a thousand buttons that we distributed up campus. You can't walk or spit on campus without seeing one of these fabulous buttons. We then had some judges come in from different places around the campus, and we chose one image and we made them on t-shirts, and then we gave away 200 t-shirts as part of that. And again, it's pretty awesome to see these t-shirts about intellectual freedom transferring and wandering around the libraries. But again, this ex we had exhibitions of materials and banned books from the collection. We really got to expand on what this means. We had games, coloring pages, and other interactive prizes and things of that nature. But one of the things that I've really started to work on a, a lot lately in one of our more recent initiatives is hosting events with living artists. And this can be hard to do because I have no money. In fact, I would say I have negative money, I feel like. <laughs> but in the pictures you're going to see, Peter and Donna Thomas right here, and they are artists from California in the United States, and that is them and their traveling bookmobile. They've traveled probably around 400,000 miles now over the last 10 years, and these are two folks that are the, what are we going to call in this United States, the pioneers of artist bookmaking, folks from Berkeley. You'll also see, I really don't need to point them out, Orange Music, you can tell who they are, and they're a duo of experimental and performance poets from Argentina. One of my colleagues and close friends is from Argentina, he had these folks in and said, I need a space. I said, sure, we can't pay them. They didn't care because their other space backed out on them. Here you see Hub City Opera, and this is a new organization in New Brunswick, New Jersey, where they came to the art library, where it's located in New Jersey, and a lot of their folks are in the arts scene and the folks that are involved with that. So they came and gave a performance and did pieces of the opera. It was a really great way for them to get their name out, and a really great thing to have sound, live music, in the art library. And one of the things that I always say, hosting living artists provides an ephemeral scholarly experience you can't get from a book. Not that I'm knocking books. <laughs> but we've also had a lot of success, and those of you, as we know, I gave a presentation last year in Dublin about pop-up maker spaces. And we really engage and collaborate with these, with students, faculty, and staff of the RUL communities. A couple things that we've done. Lego play, again, you gotta get into it. Um, <laughs> card making, we even have, well, I'll say this much, we even have a Lego playing station in the middle of the library. You can come and play at any time. It's been a little controversial because we have a lot of kids too, but you know, our college students are way louder than those children. <laughs> Lego play, card making, I asked, I sent a call out over our listserv and asked for, could, does anybody have stra strap booking stuff or things they don't want? We can make cards for the next 20 years. Um, the button making, the badge make, button or badge making. We have coloring initiatives, pumpkin decorating, journal making, but probably the most important these ma maker spaces have had on the art library. It's really encouraged engagement and help form partnerships, as well as encourage, cross, to, cr encourage, cross, blah, blah, encourage and promote cross disciplinary collaboration to bring new users into the library. The pop-up maker spaces provide that hands-on learning like the Lego, and that can really hone your creative thinking skills, your problem solving skills, and listen, these are crucial to scholarly research. We use all of these when we're scholarly researching. So why not do something fun with your students? And then transition them over to, oh, maybe the EBSCO host, uh, nothing as exciting as the EBSCO host database. Um, you don't need a lot of money or a state-of-the-art makerspace to create a culture of creativity in your library. Again, I believe that I never, ever go to my, my boss asking more than $100. And usually I don't even have to go to her. I find the people on campus, I know the people on campus who have money and want to partner and collaborate because I don't have an event without having partners. Because one thing that the Rutgers University Libraries does not do, get people to an event. And I'm tired of having no one show up for an event. I don't have time for that. So lastly, the Makerspaces activities can be learning moments that tell stories that highlight the positive of the library. And they're really flashy and they're fun and people want to know what's happening. And I'm not going to go into details on the pop-up makerspaces because as some of you know, I've written three or four papers about them. And again, 
they'll be mentioned in the finality of this. But really, why does this all matter? Embedded reference hours, exhibition spaces, having events, experiences with living artists and pop-up maker spaces are ways in that we can reach out and engage with our communities. These types of experience and learning moments strengthen the ties with local community and your surrounding neighborhoods. And that builds goodwill for the library. It promotes cross-disciplinary collaboration, which is crucial to the advancement of higher education. You can't learn from a book what you can learn from an ephemeral experience with a librarian, a living artist, or experience in art in general. And outreach and engagement helps the libraries tell their story and show the value as a crucial, as the libraries as a value and crucial component to the learning in higher education. Thanks for your attention. Let me know contact. You can contact me in many ways if you have questions, and you can also find this on SlideShare. So, thank you. <laughs>